greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and just want to share with you an honor, privilege, and blessing it is to be with you in worship this morning. This truly is a gift to look out and see such a wonderful gathering of God's children. Let us pray. O oh Lord, open our hearts and our minds. We pray that the words that come forth from this place be words marked by your divine inspiration. In Jesus' name we do pray and say thanks. Amen. Reading from Matthew's Gospel. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds. But when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed it with three measures of flour until all of it was living. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The word of God for the people of God. You know, there's a popular phrase that we are all very, very, very familiar with that's attributed to a United States newspaper editor by the name of Arthur Brisbane. In 1911, an article about journalism and publicity that he wrote contained the following statement. Use a picture. It's worth a thousand words. We're familiar with that statement now. We say it all the time. A picture is worth a thousand words. And we also know what it means. It means that complex ideas can often be portrayed by just a single image. Now, prior to the 1900s, people enjoyed paintings and portraits and things of that search for centuries. And it was easy for 20th century American journalists to say a picture is worth a thousand words and put it into practice. Because, you know, they possessed uh, luxury cameras. They started to develop these cameras like in the late 1800s and by the 1900s could produce pictures. And then with the printing presses could have these pictures disseminated throughout the land through paper and print. Pictures <laughs> became something that we were readily, readily, readily familiar with. Now, in the 21st century of today, oh my goodness, we could take this statement for granted because pictures are part of every single thing we do. I mean, we, we take pictures at, at, at the drop of a button. I mean, we even pull out our cell phones now that have cameras attached to them, and we can sit there and take a picture in an instant, like I'm about to do right now. We can 
just take a picture here, we can take a picture here, we can look right take the vacation Bible school. I mean, we could make an Instagram right now and advertise vacation Bible school for next week with these pictures, and it would be worth a thousand words. It would let people know what's going on. We can take pictures, use social media. We can even print pictures that we take at home in our rooms. So of course, the idea that a picture is worth a thousand words is something that we are so readily familiar with. But what about the days of Jesus when these types of pictures, and for that matter, many of the portraits that people have enjoyed for centuries weren't part of the environment? How to portray that which is complex and never has been seen poses a challenge, particularly for those of us who are so used to pictures. <laughs> But that's exactly what Jesus does in the gospel this morning. He vividly explains the most complex spiritual reality of the kingdom of heaven with words. And he uses five simple stories to illustrate the reality of the empire of God or the kingdom of heaven. Now, if a picture is indeed worth a thousand words, then I would contend that a parable is worth a glimpse of the kingdom. Amen. John 1 and 18 says, No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Seems pretty appropriate that the one who gives us a glimpse of God the same one who through his parables gives us glimpses of the kingdom. Jesus provides verbal snapshots of kingdom characteristics and I would contend on this morning since we're all residents of Colonial Heights and we're familiar with the different businesses and establishments in this area, I would contend that in these parables Jesus presents snapshots of the kingdom similar to but this is a symbol of. I know it's kind of far off, but I wonder, can anybody read what's on this cup? Chick-fil-A. Chick Amen. Thank, thank, thank God for 2020 vision. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Chick-fil-A. Now, now the, the, <laughs> Jesus uses these parables to illustrate the kingdom in what I like to call on this morning a Chick-fil-A kind of way. Uh, let, let me explain. Uh, I was in Chick-fil-A this week. Um, We've got a, one of our students who's, who's a musician for our campus minister who has a job there. And uh, I will often provide him with transportation to his work. Now, there are a number of United Campus Ministries affiliated students and other BSU students who actually are employed at Chick-fil-A. So we say praise God for that. We're thankful for that. Uh, but I like to go from time to time, similar to what Pastor Mike likes to do, I like to sometimes do sermon work in places like Starbucks or in some other you know, business ventures like that. But Chick-fil-A has a wonderful place. And I'm going to tell you something. Starbucks had better look out. They better look out as far as getting people in to do their work. Chick-fil-A has a great environment to do that kind of work. I mean, they got great food. They got free Wi-Fi, right? And, and, and they've got great music. You know, when you go in there sometimes, if you listen to the background, they're playing contemporary Christian music Amen. through their, through their way, you know. But now, now, I heard a song, How Great Is Our God, this past week when I was there on Wednesday. I personally like Randy's version a little bit better, but, but that's just, you know. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, I, I, I was in there working on the sermon, and I, I got comfortable. I um, decided I wanted to order something to drink, so I went to the counter of the cashier, and I ordered a a diet lemonade, and a large one, you know, because it's really good. I ordered a large one, and when they handed me the lemonade after the transaction, the cashier says what all of them say after they finish the transaction. They say, my pleasure. And every time they serve you, they say, my pleasure. Where else can you go? And all of the staff, whenever they serve you, say, my pleasure, right? I mean, it's a great place to go. Now, I can promise you, in using this example, in no way did I get, like, offered any Chick-fil-A sandwiches, so this is not like an endorsement. I'm just doing it because it's really interesting how this connection takes place. I remember back in February when they opened, I had the pleasure of being in there, and I spoke with their owner, Cole Jordan, and he was telling me about the Christian principles that are behind the store, the fact that it's a Christian organization, yeah. and the two owners, the brothers that owned it, used to work 12-hour shifts throughout the week, 
And what happened is they decided, in, in reference to their faith and also to, for a time of rest, they took the Sabbath, which is why they're not open on Sundays, Amen. because they had to take that whole day off. If you wouldn't work in 12-hour shifts, six days a week, you need a Sabbath. Amen? So that's what they decided to do. And he was talking about the Christian base and the principles that really, really drive that restaurant. And he told me that there were three, he used three terms to describe the way they like to train their employees for the work. Three terms, and I couldn't quite remember what he said those three terms were. So I was racking my brain on this Wednesday and sipping lemonade and racking my brain. And then all of a sudden I took a look around the restaurant and I saw a, a, a young lady with a blue shirt on and a Chick-fil-A name badge sitting down and she was enjoying her break. I mean, she was on break. Now I've learned this from going to Chick-fil-A frequently. If you see somebody sitting in a blue shirt, that means they're a man. So I went over to her and I said, um, excuse me, you're a manager, right? And she said, yes. And I said, what are the three training principles that Chick-fil-A uses to prepare their employees? And she said, hmm. She said, you know, um, Cole hired me to train the employees. That's why I'm here. But I don't quite remember what those three <laughs> principles were. But what she did assure me is that she had them in her manual. And she says, after I finish my break, I'll go and get that information for you. And so she was enjoying her break and she was drinking one of those delicious peach milkshakes. And I'm thinking if she had paused from that peach milkshake to entertain my question, I said, that's, that, that's, that's what they're all about. So a few minutes later, she came back and she says, I've got it for you. She said three principles. She said demonstration, imitation, and repetition. When they train their employees, they demonstrate how it is they are to make all of the items, how it is they are to operate the machinery. They demonstrate it. And then they step back, and for about a week, they watch the employees imitate the same things that they had showed them how to do. And then after that time has, has come, they step away, and then they say, just keep repeating, repetition. Just keep doing the same thing, and we're going to be all right. Well, it's my opinion this morning that the glimpses of the kingdom in these parables do just that for us. Demonstration, imitation, and repetition. Now, our first two parables are the example of demonstration. Kingdom of God has small beginnings, and at times it may even seem that God's activity is invisible. But there's a huge impact from what God is doing in our lives. In the mustard seed story, we, you know, we think about the mustard seed, the size of it. It's so small. I mean, one mustard seed is almost imperceptible. You almost can't even see it as so small. But mustard seeds, when they're planted, they grow and they blossom and they flourish far beyond the initial imagination of what they could become. And the parable even says that they get to the place where they are even hospitable and protective for birds who are looking to nest. Something that small just expands to the place where people looking for rest can come. Birds looking for rest can come. And I'm reminded of the, what, what Jesus taught his disciples. He said, if, if, if God so cares for the sparrow, how much more does God care for you? Yeah. We think about the parable of the yeast. Jesus says that a small amount of fermented dough, that yeast, if it's mixed with a large quantity of flour, it can produce a lot of leavened bread. And there are some scholars that say that a, a little bit of yeast, if it were mixed with eight and a half gallons of flour, it could produce enough bread to feed a hundred people. Something very small has a lot of power packed in it. And, and, and we look around and sometimes we don't see some of the large miraculous <coughs> things that God is doing, but we, are, we can rest assured that the kingdom works in small forms that become large in the eyes. God is present even when it appears that God is invisible or God is absent or God is not there. And in faith, we trust God's presence, even in the appearance of God's absence. These parables are a demonstration that the kingdom is this way. It starts with something small, maybe even imperceptible, but it has a large impact going beyond what we can even imagine. And God is still at work in our world, even today, transforming the little blessings of our lives into mighty, magnificent miracles. We often miss it from time to time. Sometimes we don't always see it. And we can even take for granted the little ways in which God blesses us. The second two parables, the third and the fourth one, are the imitation. 
the miraculous kingdom has ultimate value. It must be searched for and discovered, however. It's like that treasure hidden in the field. You know, in, in this particular parable, there are some commentators who say that the person who found the treasure in the field actually wasn't the treasure, but stumbled upon it. But upon stumbling upon the, the treasure, realized what its worth was, and then hid that treasure again, and then said, you know what, I have got to get this field. I have got to possess this field because I found something in it. I stumbled upon something that is so great, I must possess it. And it said that with joy, he went and sold everything that he had. He mortgaged it all. I mean, all of his pension, everything that he got rid of it, and he sold, he, he got rid of it so he could come and purchase that field. And in purchasing that field, was able to receive the blessings and the benefits of that treasure which was buried and hidden. Similar to that, the pearl merchant also had the experience of discovering a pearl of such great value. He said, oh, I've got to have that pearl. Now, the contrast between the person who found the treasure and the pearl merchant is that the pearl merchant is actually looking for a pearl of great value. And when he discovered it, he said, I've got to have this so similar to the person who found the treasure. The pearl merchant took everything that he had and traded it in for the cash to buy that pearl of great, great value. God has made this priceless kingdom available to us. But we've got some work to do as far as discovering what that kingdom is truly worth. It's challenging for us to discover, but it's of the utmost importance. But the parable calls us to imitation of the person who found the treasure and the pearl merchant. We are to imitate them from the standpoint of giving all that we have of belonging to the kingdom. Now, interestingly enough, at first it seemed as if once these two gave everything they had in order to get the treasure and the, and the pearl, that they actually possessed it. But another way of looking at it is the fact that this, these treasures were so valuable to them that they actually possessed those who became part of them. That's what the kingdom does for us. We don't possess the kingdom. But it is such a such great value and worth that we willingly give ourselves in possession of God. We sell everything that we have. We give everything that we have for the kingdom because it's worth that. <coughs> and finally, repetition. Now this miraculous, impactful, valuable kingdom not only includes those categories, but this kingdom is something that's inclusive and it's intended to be made available to all. It's like a net that was let down in a lake. Scriptures say it was filled with all kinds of fish in an indiscriminate type of way. I mean, every type of fish that you could imagine. When that net was let down, it caught them all. It didn't let any of them get away. It didn't let the trout, the flower, the bat. It didn't let any of that get away. It caught all the fish. But when that net was placed ashore, the parable tells us that the fish were sorted not by their type, but by their condition, whether they were good or bad fish, not whether they were a specific type. That lets us know that righteousness is an inner condition. It's not an outer condition. It's God's intention for us to experience this kingdom of all of God's people, no matter where they're from, no matter what their makeup or background is of concern for us is our spiritual condition. Jesus concludes this portion of text with an analogy saying that those who are instructed for the kingdom of heaven, those law teachers, are like the owner of a house who brings forth old and new treasures from that storage place. Matthew 5, 17 says that Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. We know that this Gospel of Matthew was written primarily to Jewish Christians, people who fully understood the law. But it was not just about the law alone. Jesus came to show that God is not only about the law. 
Jesus came to fulfill it by instituting what John Wesley calls grace for all of us. That grace that allows us to experience this free, unmerited gift from God that allows us to be part of the kingdom. The kingdom is a reality that we're called to live out now. Judgment, that's for the future. But the kingdom is a reality for us to live in the current time. And God charges disciples with living out the reality of the kingdom. Awareness of its impact and of its value, that's only part one of our mission. But part two is the repetition. And that's the repetition of like that person, those fishermen who dropped the net in the sea. We're called to repeat the process of sharing the gospel, of sharing God's love, of embodying God's grace. Wesley said, do all the good you can, as long as you can, for as many people as you can, in every way that you can. We're called to drop our nets in that Essentially, that's the formula for the United Methodist Church mission to make disciples for the transformation of the world. Friends, these glimpses of the kingdom are gifts of God, and they are evidence of God's grace. The short stories that were in our text grant us revelation, inspiration, and reiteration. They are like God's perfect shots, providing us with the gains of God's glory. There was a New Testament professor by the name of Bill Weber who said, the kingdom of God comes in inches, and we must learn to celebrate every small glimpse we can find when the unemployed find a job, when the substance addict gets sober, that poor child stays in school, doesn't drop out, gets an education. From these glimpses of the kingdom of the sea in our text every day, we walk away from these experiences with greater faith in God, from noticing the little things, with greater hope for living understanding the value of our kingdom citizenship and with greater love for gathering all of God's children so that they can also become part of this kingdom. May we notice these glimpses as the miraculous work of the same God who transformed the death by crucifixion of a homeless peasant from Galilee into the resurrection event of the Savior, the Son of God, 